Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am here today with Barbara Johnson, and we are going to talk about something that not a lot of people talk about when it comes to musicians, and that is your finances. We're going to talk about, uh, well, Barbara is, is an accountant and a bookkeeper and a CPA, and she, you know, she does taxes and bookkeeping for all kinds of businesses, but I've been talking to her recently about the specific challenges of musicians and um, dealing with their finances. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but before we do, I just love to have you, Barbara, let them know kind of a little bit about you and um, how you started working in this field and maybe anything a little bit personal. I know you, you're not a musician, but you've got some, uh, cre- your creative side. Oh, yeah, I, I actually do. I um, actually was a musician for a long you time. You were, I forgot. You were a musician yeah. before. I started playing the piano when I was three years old. And then uh, because my father wanted me to go into music education, I uh, didn't. <laughs> I haven't played the piano or anything since then. So it's, it's, but I played the trumpet and the piano. So I know a little bit about music, at least somewhat. <laughs> but um, I, my father wanted me to be an accountant when I was younger because I was good with math. And I immediately joined the Navy and went the opposite direction, basically. But after uh, being in the military for 10 years, I got out and I was working for a game store called War Games West in uh, Albuquerque. And they needed somebody to help out in the back room doing inventory and bookkeeping and stuff, as well as running the store. I fell in love with it. And so I got my degree in accounting and have been doing taxes and bookkeeping and everything since then. So I've, I've really enjoy it. It's my passion, you know, I love to help people. And, and one way to do that is if you're in business, you need to know where you're going and the finances is a roadmap, you know. That's so interesting that you fell into it. I mean, it kind of happened for me too. I was a music major and then I, um, I had to take an account. I had to take a, some kind of practical art type of class and I decided to take accounting and I fell in love with it also, which maybe some of our listeners are like, that's crazy. Like you fell in love with accounting, but there's something very grounding about the, I don't know, the, the structure Mm -hmm. of accounting, I think for me anyway. Well, music's based on math and so is accounting. And that's the nice thing about it is they're both got a creative side to them. Yep. Yep. For sure. Well, you work with a ton of, of small business owners and, and I, I, would you say that you work with a lot of sole proprietors? Almost, almost exclusively sole proprietors. Okay. And pretty much most musicians are going to be sole proprietors and le- mm-hmm. unless they're, they're making just a, a lot of money, <laughs> you know, a good deal yeah. of money where they're going to want to, or have like a team that work with them and, you know, they're going to become an S corp or a C corp or something, but most of them are sole proprietors. So let me ask you, like, what are the, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see sole proprietors make? Let's start with like, maybe with their bookkeeping. Okay. Well, the first thing is uh, that a lot of people make as far as mistakes is they don't keep track of it regularly. Bookkeeping, if you, you can collect all the receipts in the world and put them all in one little place. But if you, when you go back to look at them, you don't know what you spent. Mm. If you've ever looked at a Walmart receipt, it doesn't <laughs> list out everything. It's got numbers and half a sentence. And you're like, okay, what was that? Was that really business? What, what do I categorize that as? So one thing is, is not keeping up with it regularly. That is, that is a big thing. Um, the other thing is, is many sole proprietors don't know things that can be deductible. Everybody thinks, oh, I can deduct the mileage in my car. So they sit and driving to the grocery store and they're deducting that mileage but that's not business mileage. It, it doesn't count 
you know, from where you are to where you work. It's just everything after that. So there's, there's different things like that that people keep track of that it's great that you're keeping track of it for your personal, but as far as being deductible, it, it isn't deductible that way. People think that you know things aren't deductible and they are. That is the other, other thing with that is if you have a, an office in your house, some of your mortgage, some of your rent, some of your electric, all of that can be deducted depending on you know, how big your office is and how much uh, you, your rent and all of that is. It, it's a percentage that can be deducted with that. So there's various ways that, that people don't keep track of enough of stuff or keep track of too much stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. And I love to talk about the home office deduction because most musicians can take that. Most of them at least have a practice space in their home that they can count as, as a home office or they have a, a studio you know, in, in the garage or in their bedroom or something like that. Um, and most of the time it would qualify. Right, pra- that makes, off- that's absolutely because like the, the practice spaces, basically for a home office, it has to be used regularly and exclusively for business. Well, if you've got a piano sitting in the middle of your, in the middle of your room, you're not going to do much on that piano besides sit and practice, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or that type of thing. You know, if you have a studio where you're regularly practicing your music, pretty much that's regular use. And if it's set up so that you, it's basically only used for that, it's the perfect type of space to be a home office. And that is deductible, which is a percentage of even your mortgage and electric and everything that can be written off for taxes. Yeah. And I mean, I think the key is it, it comes right off of any income that you make. Absolutely. Right. Yes. That's the less tax that you have to owe. (laughs) Yes. Yes. It's, it's, it's really one of the best deductions that you can take in my opinion, as a sole proprietor. Um, So I think that there's like a lot of misconceptions um, among musicians about even like how to deal with, with the stuff on their taxes. I know that I've, I've done a few um, like tax tips and stuff on social media and I, I see there's a lot of people confused about like, well, if I have a business, like, do I have to do a schedule C and, and all of that? So what advice can you give them? Like, where, are, where do they need to be at with their income to be filing a, a schedule C on their taxes? And what does that actually mean? Some of them might even know, not know what a schedule C is. Basically a schedule C is for anybody that is a sole proprietor. <clears throat> if you have a business and you're making money, whether you're using it all up in expenses or not, you should file a Schedule C, which is you take all of your income and you get to duck all of your expenses and that either you pay tax on whatever you income you made or if it's a negative, it can offset any other income that you had. So a lot of times musicians that I've known, they have a second job. You know, they have music and that is their passion and that's what they're, they do gigs with and they make money And then they have a second job where they're, I don't know, flipping burgers. Most of them don't, but anyway, whatever that second job is. Working an office job, a lot of them, I'd say. There you go. Or they're a Um, teacher or something like that. Music teacher, especially even. But Mm -hmm. those jobs, you get a W-2 and it says, okay, you've made this much money. You've had this much taxes. Well, your Schedule C then can counterbalance against that. So either it will add extra income to it if you've made more money or it can actually subtract away from that income if you've had more expenses than income in the business. You have to be careful when doing that because the IRS does watch that closely to make sure it's actually a business and not a hobby. But it can actually end up to your benefit to do both, have a a job and a business that you're um, working at. Yeah, for sure. It it definitely can because it allows you to write off so many things against that income that you wouldn't be able to write off otherwise. Um, What where is that line as far as the way the IRS looks at it, whether it's a business or a hobby? Well, the line is you need to make in you you have to start making positive income three of five years. So most businesses, the first year, almost none of them make an actual income. Some of the strictly, completely only service-based incomes uh, in businesses, as in they, they have no outlay. They're just like a, an office that they're like a, they just do jobs from on their computer. Even they won't have a positive income their first year sometimes because 
they've got to buy a new computer or the software needs to be updated. They have to have certain files, um, different coaching programs. But after that, the second, third, fourth, fifth year, the IRS checks on those. And those you want to start being making towards you're actually getting that income coming in onto the positive side. Because if you're not making money, the IRS can't tax it. And that's never a, a good situation to look at. Um, that's the whole point. They want to make sure you're, you're actually doing it as a business because if you're just doing it as a hobby or just doing it to lose money so that you don't have to pay as much tax on your other job. Yeah. Um, they, they don't, they, they frown on that. I'm sure they do. You know, they, <laughs> you know, you're in business to make money. If you're not making money, they want to see where you're actually making corrections in order to be making money. I think with musicians, like sometimes they're thinking, why wouldn't I be making money every year? You know what I mean? Like if the, I think it's hard for them to wrap their mind around, they were, they would be expecting to make income every year. Maybe you can explain why, especially like what you said about how the, the, usually the first year of business, people don't make any money and they might think, well, why would I want to be in business if I'm not making any money? But maybe you can explain how that's different than not making any money on your IRS forms. Right. So you can actually have a, an income, but like a lot of people, when they get started, they like, like I said, with a graphic designer, with a musician, when you're, when you're doing jobs on your IRS form, your cell phone that you're using to make those calls to set up those jobs, that is a deduction. Your um, equipment, if you break a guitar string, if you uh, need to get your piano tuned, if you've got this, if you need to buy a new electric uh, keyboard because it broke. Um, any type of those types of things, you just you pay for those and you don't think about it. But those are expenses and they go against your your income. Again, like with the home office, you have a space set up to practice. You have a place set up as a studio. Those types of things that that rent and income comes off of your business income, and so therefore you could be in the negative. Advertising, you've got to somehow get your name out there so that you can. Uh, sell your songs, sell your music, write songs for people. You've got to promote yourself somehow. Right. So it's like paying for your, your website costs. Website costs. If you do the LinkedIn, they've got the premier membership. That's an annual membership. The LinkedIn is strictly for marketing your business. That can be a deduction, all of that. And so if you look at that, that can make you have a negative income, which negative income is not making a profit. Whereas, and, but you're sitting there going, but I did make money. I, I did, you know, a thousand dollars in income. I know I, I did two jobs and that was great, <laughs> you know, but it, after you add up all the expenses, it doesn't look that way. Right. So it helps a, you pay for things you would have paid for. Like, like you said at the beginning, like cell phone, right? I'm going to have a right. cell phone no matter what, but right. if I make a thousand dollars for the year in music that paid for my entire year of my cell phone. There you go. And right. that's, that's what it's for. And so you don't think, I mean, according to the tax return, you didn't make an income, but you did. Yeah. So. I think, I think it's helpful to reframe that because I think people are like, well, why would I want to be in business if I didn't make any money? But yeah, I look at all the things that I would normally pay for anyway, my internet, my cell phone, things like that, that I can write off um, that aren't specific like there's there's mileage and stuff but like you wouldn't be doing that mileage if you didn't go to the gig but there are things that you would probably do anyway like for me i write off my spotify i write off my right. uh my audible like things like that um that are subscriptions that i would potentially have anyway That's that true. are totally business related if you're a musician right which makes it really really good there's also if you take music lessons as in you want to increase your skill in something, you know, um, you want to learn how to do something new on or, or learn a different instrument. Even that is deductible as well. Even mm -hmm. those new skills, those new coach, you want to get a coach to help you market your business, you know, uh, so that you can sell your music more again, deductible. That's right. If you want to take one of my programs, they're tax deductible. <laughs> They are, well, they are, as long as they are helping future their, their business, which they do. Yes, definitely. Well, let's talk about equipment. Cause I know musicians, they love their gear, right? They love to buy new gear. It's really fun. And I think 
a lot of times they're not taking advantage of the fact that they could be writing this off against their income. So what are the rules around this? Like, I know there's like, you can depreciate or um, from what I remember from doing my own taxes, there's like a, a, a single year deduction that you can take as well. You can take what they call a section 179 deduction on anything under $2,500 mm. as far as equipment goes. So if it costs less than $2,500, you can take it all in one year as a deduction to lower your income. Um, the, thing, the thing with that is, is that means if you go and buy a new guitar or buy an amp or you know, buy a new trumpet, violin, anything like that, even buy a computer that you're using in your studio. Yeah, Again, as long even, as it's- Even like a microphone or a, um, a webcam or any of those things, you can totally absolutely. deduct. As long as you're using them in your business regularly, and I don't mean every, every session, you know, you might not use the, the guitar. You have, you have two guitars, an acoustic and electric, and you may not use the electric in every song you produce. That's, that's not what's required. You just have to use it regularly. As in, I perform songs with this guitar, I perform songs with that guitar. I use this microphone because it makes me sound this way, but this microphone makes me sound differently, and so I use it for better. Um, anything like that, as long as you're using it regularly in the business to do what you do to make money, it's, it qualifies. And so that's a huge deduction for musicians. Yep, yep. I, I, and I think a lot of musicians aren't taking advantage of that, so I would... I'd love you guys think about that. Think about all the things that you've bought over the years that you probably haven't. I know I've occasionally like forgotten to write something. I'm like, shoot, I got a new computer last year and I completely forgot to write it off. So this is where I think it's really important to keep your finances, finances separate as far as your personal and your business. How do you recommend that people do that? The first thing, the first thing that, that the IRS requires is you have a separate business account. So it's completely separate from your personal and you don't, you, you don't use your business account to buy yourself things and you don't use your personal account to buy the business things. If you have to transfer the money to whichever account it needs to be. So there's a money trail. Like for me, if I want to, um, if I need some new accounting software, I transfer money from my personal into my business if I need to. And then I use that to buy the accounting software then I pay myself back because the business is making money and I transfer it back over. But either way you do it, you want to have that paper trail and you want to have separate accounts. You have separate account for checking, savings, and credit card. Because I know you don't just walk into a store and plop down a thousand dollars for something. Everybody yeah. puts it on a card and you want to make sure that card starts out at zero and then only use it for business. Yep. Definitely. And heck, while you're at it, get a credit card that gives you some kind of benefits. There's so many credit cards that either pay you back in cash, they pay you uh, statement credit, you can use, you know, get rewards from them that you could spend some other way. I just like those are so available now. Why wouldn't you get them if you're going to spend the money anyway on your business, right? Right. And that makes it really, really a nice, nice setup. But you need one specifically for business. It doesn't have to be in the business name. It just has to be specific and only used for business. Yeah, I think that's what's different about being a sole proprietor. You don't have to have everything in your business name. Now that I am an, you know, I'm an, an S corp, I have to have everything in the business name because Absolutely. it needs to be completely separate. But right. luckily for you guys, you don't have to do that. But then when I just said, luckily, I thought, well, it also does make it a little bit harder. It's so easy to commingle things when you're a sole proprietor. Um, and I remember feeling like I didn't really know where my business was at because I was just still so, even though I was keeping things separate, like you said, I needed to buy something in a business. So I would transfer money from my personal account. And then if I wanted to pay myself, I transfer money back. And it starts to feel like, you don't really know how much you're making in your business. So right. how do you, you know, how do you recommend that, that people make sure that they like really know what's going on in their business finances? Well, that's where having a bookkeeper or doing the bookkeeping yourself comes in. If you have a person or you do it yourself every week, put those receipts in, put the income in um, monthly run a report. You know, if you use QuickBooks online, it's fantastic. Um, I, I have services where I can help you set that up or, I can do the bookkeeping, but 
you want to you want to have either a spreadsheet or QuickBooks or something where you can input those expenses and that income so you can look at it any time and go, OK, this is what I've made so far. This is where I'm at. You'd be surprised at how much money you really do make and how much you really do spend for the business. <laughs> there have been people that, you know, I know I'm making one hundred thousand dollars, but why don't I have any any money in my bank account? OK, where well, you're spending one hundred and fifty thousand every year. I'm not sure why you think you're making money that way. <laughs> you know, that's that that happens because too many times with sole proprietors, they do they they don't commingle, but they they transfer stuff so much they don't know what's going on in the business, and so it, it gets it gets muddled. Yeah, and that's and, where and the I, bookkeeping comes in. Yeah, I think keeping up with it too. I know uh, true confessions. I mean, I've I've done my own taxes for years. Um, but because I was also an accountant, I was lazy about the bookkeeping because I would just keep a spreadsheet and I knew exactly how much I had every day. Like I was used to this after working at the opera where money was very tight. Mm -hmm. I would keep a cash flow spreadsheet and know exactly where I was at. But that also caused me to be very lazy in my bookkeeping. And I'd get to the time of year when I needed to do taxes. And I would have to spend, I'd be, my family would know. They're like, stay away from her for like three days because I would just have to sit there and input everything that happened right. into the system because I hadn't done it the whole time. And so, you know, that's where bookkeeping can really, really help. And also most of you aren't doing your own taxes anyway. So, right. you know, having someone that does both of those things at once will just take a lot off of your mind. And with the people that I work with, it's, it's nice and simple. I keep up with their bookkeeping throughout the year. They can look and know exactly where they're at any point in time. And then come into the year, it just rolls around. We do their taxes as well. And so everything is done. They don't have to worry about that. They literally can focus on what they love doing most, making music. Yeah. And I think the key is having somebody that's, quote, on your team, you know, that you, that you can go to when you, whenever you have a question. If you're like, I'm thinking of buying this thing, or I'm thinking of, you know, expanding my home so I can have a studio, you know, how will this impact my taxes or whatever? You can go to, to the person that you're working with and ask those things before you even do them to make sure you understand how they're going to impact you. Right. And that's, that's a huge thing because literally any type of question, like I've had people come to me, okay, I'm an LLC. I want to convert to an S corporation. When does that make sense? I've heard that it, you know, I should do that right now. And really there's a, a line where becoming an S corporation makes a big sense difference and where it costs more than it, than it, it, it is a benefit. And you have to find that line. And, and the best thing to do is you ask somebody, Hey, this is what I'm doing right now. You know, I'm thinking of becoming an S corporation. You know, what does that look like? Is it worth it? And then that person, me specifically, we can look at it and go, okay, it makes sense. Yeah, it's going to save you, you know, $1,000 know, a year at least. Oh, no, it's going to save you $5,000 a year. Let's do that for sure. You know, and, and that type of thing. I, basically, I'm the CFO. So you don't have to worry anything. You make the decisions. You're the CEO. You run the business. And I literally handle all the financial stuff. If you have questions about financial stuff, you can look at the numbers and you can ask me. Because I've got 16 years of experience to be able to sit there and go, okay, this is the way it goes. This is what's happening. This is where things are going. You know, and then you make the decision because you're the CEO. Yeah. And just having that peace of mind makes you feel like, okay, I've got this part covered. Now I can focus on the music. And I think that's really important. Um, just to go back to that discussion about the S Corp. Um, I, number one, I've heard... <laughs> Uh, people saying things like, oh, become an LLC. It helps you on your taxes. And that is absolutely not true. Correct. Being an LLC is a, is a legal entity. And I'm not going to say whether you should or shouldn't do that because that's all about separating your business and your, your personal um, and legally right. protecting yourself. But like I have heard people online saying things like you should become an LLC because it helps you on your taxes. And that is absolutely not true. Correct. Correct. That's not true. As an LLC, as a single member LLC, you're still a sole proprietor. The, as far as taxes go, it doesn't help you at all. As far as protection and liability, it is a state entity and it does give you some limited liability unless you commingle funds and then it doesn't do anything for you. That's true. You know, if you, if you mix your funds at all, 
all limited liability is out the door, you know, that there's no limited liability there. But as far as taxes go, there's no difference. You still file a Schedule C. Yep. Unless you decide to elect as an S Corp, which as you were saying earlier, like, is that line to decide which one is better for you different for everyone? Or is there kind of like an income level? That it's kind of between, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of different for everybody, but I would say anywhere, once you get into like the $7,500,000 range, you look at it closer because when you become an S corporation, one, you have to completely separate everything. You're filing two tax returns. And then you have to look at, you have to then pay yourself a salary. So you have to go on payroll because you're no longer an owner. You're a, a, a member, you're a, a, a shareholder right. and you're an employee of the S corporation. And so you have to pay yourself a salary, a reasonable salary. It doesn't mean you can't take any more money out, but then that counts as capital gains. And so there's a tax line there and you have to look at, okay, I'm paying now myself as an employee and I'm taking this money out. You're going to take, pay taxes on both of those, but it's different between the two because you're not paying that self-employment tax anymore. Right. It's you're paying it as the S corporation. And then you have the fee for doing two tax returns. You have to have one done by March 15th and the other by April 15th. Yeah. And if you're in the state of California, well, I think this is true of whether you're S corp or not. If you're an LLC, like we have to pay like $800 a year to be an LLC in California. Oh yeah. You have your, of course, that's a state filing fee. Yeah. That's a, Some any, states any are state like way those. cheaper though. California oh, extremely, is expensive. Extremely. California is expensive for everything. A one bedroom apartment for a thousand bucks. Come on. Right. <laughs> right. Or 1200 bucks. I, I had a friend send me, tell me it was 1200 bucks for a one bedroom apartment. Oh I was God. like, okay, no, thank you. That's, that's too expensive for my blood. I'll stay in Florida. <laughs> yep. But no, that line is really helpful. That 75 to hundred thousand. Like if you guys who are listening are nearing that, even if you have people working for you, like if you have contractors that are working for you, but your business is making that, I would start looking into it just because for me, I waited a little too long and I ended up having to do it in the middle of the year. It made things messy. Um, I should have done it in 2019, but I didn't, I waited till 2020 and it just, it's messy to do it in the middle of the year. I would try to look into it before you're to the point where like, oh, now I definitely need to do this because yeah. it's going to save me a lot of money. Well, according to the IRS, you're, you need to file that election by March 15th if you want to be an S corporation for the year. So like this year for 2022, if you wanted to be an S corporation, you needed to file it by March 15th of this year. So that next year you'll file that 1120S instead of a normal schedule C. Right. You can actually file a thing that says I, I want it, you know, I want it to be retroactive. Right. It, you can, and that's a late filing. Pain. Yeah, there's a late filing and you have yeah. to explain why it, it is a big pain. And Let me tell you, I'm still going through it with the IRS because <laughs> they're so slow now because of COVID that it's still going on, even though this happened in 2021. Yes, yes, yes. it takes so, forever. Don't it, do now, that. If you file it timely, if you file it timely, it's usually pretty quick because yeah. it's taken bar- care of by their normal systems. Right. Yeah. See, I wish I would have. I wish I would have gotten on it earlier. I wish I'd have had someone on my team that could have advised me better because I really didn't. I didn't know when was the right time to do it? I'd heard about it. It's like, it seems like a good idea. I don't know if it's right. And by the time I looked into it, you know, so just to, to put this in your guys's mind, I know most of you are not up to that income level yet, but you may be, you know, if you're, if you're teaching privately or, you know, and you have, maybe you have a combo business, maybe you're teaching privately and you're a performer, you may be up to that income level and you'd be able to look into that. So just wanted to plant that seed. Um, so is there anything else you want to let our listeners know about their finances that you, we haven't covered that you think is really, really important? Um, actually you've, you've hit most of the stuff as far as uh, the biggest thing is keep on the, keep on the numbers. If you don't keep track of that bookkeeping, here's, here's one way to look at it. If you spend one hour a week getting it done, that saves you three days at the end of, of the year, having to try and get it all together. Yeah. And having your family hate you because you're in such a bad mood. (laughs) Right. And, and it, I mean, it it makes it so much easier. Um, I will, I will say if if I'm allowed to, I have a a, a special that I'm running right now um, for the members listening to your podcast. If it's okay, I am offering $150 off bookkeeping services for the first four months. 
of anybody listening to your podcast that can refer to, you know, mention this podcast and you'll get that discount for the first four months. I can get your QuickBooks set up, get you going, show you the value. At the end of the four months, if you don't see the value in it, guaranteed, walk away. There's no harm, no foul, but try it for four months. See what you think. That's my whole thing with it. This is such a great deal too, because you help them get set up. I feel like that is three fourths of the battle of getting <laughs> everything set up, like getting your banks all attached to correctly and everything talking to each other online is, is kind of that thing that just seems so overwhelming that makes none of us start. Right. And that's, that's where it is. I mean, we, we literally, literally, if you just want me to set up the, the set up charge itself is 500 bucks and I can do that for you and get it all set up. It takes probably two weeks and get it all done and ready for you. Uh, and then I give you a little bit of training and you can take off and do it yourself. If I'm awesome. doing the monthly bookkeeping right now, it's, it's 350 minimum for, for monthly bookkeeping. And most, most musicians should fall into that area unless you're doing a lot more than just music. Um, but 350, so that would drop it down to $200 a month to try it out. Oh my gosh. Yes. I think everyone listening, if you're not, if you don't have a good system for your bookkeeping, look into this for sure. So how do they contact it? Well, first of all, if you guys mention either Brie Noble or Profitable Musician, she'll know that you came from this podcast, but how would they get in touch with you? Um, it's very easy. Um, my website is www.kisbaa.com. That's keeping it straight, bookkeeping and accounting.com. And um, my email address would be barbara.johnson at kisbaa.com. Or you can text me on my phone, wow. 321-320-2560. Lots of ways to get in touch with me. You can look me up on LinkedIn, but there's lots of Barbara Johnsons. That's harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a pain when you don't have like a super unique name, but I, I love that. Kizba. I said, like, yes. Kizba. <laughs> yes. Love it. So, and we'll have that in the show notes as well, you guys. So reach out to her, even if you're just not sure if you need bookkeeping help, like just get, you know, reach out to her, ask her a few questions and, and, and see if it's right for you. Yeah. Conversation's free. Let's have some. That's true. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, Barbara. This has been great. And I just think this is something it's part of my mission for this show. Being that I have a business background is making sure that musicians at least understand mm -hmm. what's going on business-wise, even if they're not the ones that are doing the bookkeeping, not the ones that are doing the taxes, at least they understand enough of how it all works. So they don't feel like they're not in control of their own business. Yeah, you know? that's a good thing. But thank you very much for having me. You are so welcome. And I hope you guys reach out to Barbara. Just mention Brie Noble or Profitable Musician, and you can get that 150 off for the first four months. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.